joining us now from New York is Richard Barrett. He is a former British diplomat and intelligence officer, now a senior vice president with the Soufan Group, a strategic security intelligence firm. With us here in Washington is David Gartenstein Ross. He's a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Also joining us from Reno, Nevada, is the author of Terrorism, a Self-Fulfilling Prophecy, Yoseba Zuleika. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Dr. Zuleika, let me start with you. The United States and its allies declared a war on terror in earnest after the 9-11 attacks. What is your assessment of that war right now? Because if we look at the battle lines, it seems the threat has got bigger and more dangerous. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that has, that is, if you look objectively, what has been achieved by the war on terror, uh, particularly with the war on Iraq, etc., it is pretty obvious that things have become worse. And this last episode with ISIS, uh, of which we barely know anything, uh, is just a confirmation it has been utter failure, this war on terror. So it is a good case of counterterrorism in kind of promoting more terrorism. That's part of the the book you just mentioned is a fulfilling prophecy of uh, counterterrorism in that regard. So I think we should be very critical. Oh, this is what is missing in the analysis uh, of the entire phenomenon. How much our own counterterrorist policies actually make things worse? How much they contribute to more terrorism? Richard, has the terrorist threat got bigger? You've said that uh, when one looks at the war in Syria, which is, as you point out, funded by the United States, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, you say it's likely to be an incubator for a new breed of terrorists. I think that is true, yes. Uh, it, it will be like that. I think many people who went over to join the fight probably went over with rather idealistic objectives to help the Syrian people. But I think since the Islamic State got established, most of the people going over know pretty much what they're going to get into, and, and one has to worry about what's going to happen to them in the future when they come home. I mean, not all of them will go over to train as terrorists. In fact, probably very few will. But nonetheless, the experience of being there will certainly make it more likely that they'll engage in attacks elsewhere when that particular conflict is over. But of course, on, that's on the downside. But on the upside, I, I would say that the absence of attacks in the United States, for example, has been something of a victory for the counterterrorism operations of the, of the U.S. Uh, certainly, I, I could agree with your saber that maybe there are more terrorists being um, sort of incubated around the world as a result of the policies. But nonetheless, we have to acknowledge that the attacks in, in most Western countries, not all, of course, but most Western countries have gone down. David, we just heard uh, Josh Ernest, the White House press secretary, explain the White House counterterrorism strategy. He said, uh, the plan here is to build up uh, capacity in local government so that they can take on terrorists in their own country so the United States doesn't have to be involved any longer. Is that working? Uh, well, I think that that strategy is exactly right, building up local capacity when you look at it at a theoretical level. When you look at what's actually happened in practice, you see absolutely declining local capacity in almost uh, every state which is a key battle line. Um, the one exception, I think, would be the Somali government, where uh, in 2006, 2007, you had absolute state collapse with Shabab uh, coming to control most of southern Somalia. That situation has changed, although as recent events, this awful attack in Garissa, Kenya show, um, Shabab remains a very potent force. But if you look just since 2011, at governmental capacity. Uh, it's completely collapsed in Yemen, which is now uh, de declined into a civil war. At the end of 2011, um, uh, or at the, end of, at the end of 2010, at the beginning of 2011, Syria was stable. Now it's an absolute basket case with this awful civil war that's killed over 200,000 people. ISIS and Nusra, uh, Al-Qaeda's affiliate and Al-Qaeda's spin-off organization, both controlling territory. Uh, Iraq is half controlled by ISIS at this point. Libya was stable at the end of 2010. Now it has no central government capacity. It's embroiled by civil war. Al-Qaeda and ISIS have both become major players. Uh, you had no real uh, jihadist movement in Tunisia at the end of 2010. Today, you have a potent one, albeit one that doesn't fundamentally threaten the state. Uh, and Nigeria, you have an increasing problem with Boko Haram. Uh, they're now being batted back by about four different armies, but they came to control most of Borno state earlier this year. So uh, yes, it's right to build up local government capacity, but local government capacity is declining as opposed to increasing. And in terms of, of acknowledging the 
role of the U.S. government. This is one area where I think that we need to look beyond just critiquing counterterrorism policy. I think our two biggest mistakes have been um, Iraq and Libya in terms of when we took affirmative action to uh, topple governments. And both of them were the result of not overestimating but underestimating terrorist groups, underestimating the ability of insurgents to destabilize Iraq, and in Libya, underestimating the same uh, ability because Gaddafi posed no right, threat to the quickly, U.S. Right, but very quickly, weren't those terrorist groups created in the aftermath of the fall of those governments? Uh, yes, absolutely, and thus we should have been very hesitant about going in. I mean, this is not a defense of U.S. policy, right. but I think that when we're talking about counterterrorism, we should actually peg it to what counter terrorism is. Counterterrorism isn't everything the U.S. does. Right. Yoseba, what do you make of what Richard Barrett just told us a moment ago, that uh, there have been setbacks in the fight against terrorism, but when one looks at the United States, there has not been a significant attack here after 9-11. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true in that regard. So, um, but I couldn't disagree more with the fact that, I mean, we should have had more counterterrorism. Uh, we underestimated the the possibility of, of Iraq, but isn't, isn't it the case that actually the whole thing went to hell after this, uh, this uh, war we went with just false premises that this counter-terrorist thinking brought us into, and that made us believe that actually Saddam Hussein had these uh, weapons of mass destruction, etc. And I mean, uh, there were no Al-Qaeda in, in, in Iraq, but after, after the invasion, of course, there was. This is what is called the self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. I think that uh, from the very beginning, you could even make the case of 9-11 itself, to what extent uh, the counterterrorism was complicit in creating this phenomenon. If you look back at the blind shake and all those events that were behind there, obviously there hasn't been here, all right. which also says why did we need this whole counterterrorism culture and this counterterrorism mentality and industry coming by. Let me get David's response. I mean, that's to that. a complete misinterpretation of what I said. I didn't. I did not at all say we needed more counterterrorism. What I was saying is we should have been much more hesitant about going into both Iraq and Libya if we understood the potential for terrorist movements to arise there. And the notion that the 9/11 attacks were caused by the U.S. arresting the blind sheikh when he'd planned to attack major New York City landmarks is absolutely farcical. Okay, uh, Richard, uh, do you get the impression? I mean, you've worked, you've had wide experience as a diplomat, you worked uh, in intelligence. Do you get the impression that the U.S. has a coherent counterterrorism strategy? Because, as we just heard in our report a moment ago, uh, five hundred million dollars worth of mili military aid to Yemen. We can't account for it. The United States doesn't know what happened, where the arms went. It could have ended up in the hands of Al Qaeda or in the hands of Iranian-backed rebels who have been fighting to overthrow the government of Yemen. Yeah, but counterterrorism has two partners. The United States can do quite a lot, of course, but then a lot has to rely on the host government as well, as David said. You know, there's a capacity issue there. And also, counterterrorism has a context. And the problem in Middle East in particular, and North Africa for that matter, is that the context is completely unsuitable for effective counterterrorism. You know, they, they are states in a process of collapse. They're states without strong institutions. There's been no political institutional building in most of the Middle East, really, for, you know, the last 60 years or so. So uh, this is why counterterrorism finds it so difficult to take purchase and build capacity rather than just make the situation worse. And I think that if you look at Jabhat al-Nusra, for example, in the Islamic State or the Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula or or the groups in North Africa, they are more symptoms of what's happening there than they are causes of it. You know, the, the, the situation there has allowed them to, to expand and explode. So I think that we, you know, for the United States, it's been incredibly difficult, really, to find effective partnerships and to be able to build something which has a, a projected end state. You know, I think it's been very difficult for the United States to see where is this all leading? Where do we want to end up? And we don't want to end up with complete ownership of the thing. It must be the region itself, surely, who needs to, that needs to build the sort of uh, structures that can be resilient to terrorism. David, isn't that the problem, that when the United States gets involved, like it did, you mentioned in Iraq, in Libya, it's not a tidy exercise. You know, you right. can't just wrap this up, say, OK, now we've uh, restored your country or introduced democracy to your country, yeah. and we can leave. Yeah, that's why I think we need to be uh, hesitant to overthrow uh, stability. Uh, like w When the Arab Spring began, there was this discussion of how we'd privileged stability for too long, and now it was time for sweeping change. And there was a thinking at the time, look, I was involved in these debates. I remember them very well. 
uh, the predominant view was that these revolutionary events were absolutely in U.S. interest because they undermine the narrative of jihadist groups. Um, in fact, you know, jihadism has grown everywhere where we've seen revolutionary change. That's not to say the revolutions are bad, but I think that we were looking at it from a perspective of strategic interest in the absolute wrong way, which is one thing that helped us to end up going into Libya. So I think giving enough credit to these groups and understanding that they're able to exploit changing environments is something that we need to do much more of. And I think in 2011, we had absolute policy failure in that regard. We're going to take a break right now. When we come back, more on the impact of U.S. counterterrorism strategy. Stay with us. You're watching The Heat.